Okay, hi, I'm Greg. Um, this is Chris, Mishi, Olaf. We're here to talk about the Code of Conduct. Uh, the agenda is going to be me talking about the background, what's going on, introduce Mishi, and then questions. Um, as you all know, we have a new Code of Conduct. Um, I do want to apologize for the speed of it. Um, the background is John wrote a great Linux Weekly News story about it, um, about the summary of what happened at the Maintainer Summit. Go see that for the details. But it came down to Linus and I needed to do this quickly um, for various reasons. Um, and so I rushed it. Um, I apologize for that. And I burnt political capital. But uh, after that, we tried to make up for that by talking to people. And I talked to a lot of people and worked with a lot of people um, to try and come up with the interpretation document, fix any problems that we might have, and set up the ground rules and the work for how do we go forward. Um, so I apologize for the initial rush, but um, it was necessary due to on external factors that you can read about in John's post. And um, this is something we just had to go for from there. So we have a code of conduct. We have an interpretation document. We have an email alias for problems with it. Um, we're setting up a group of people independent of the tab. Um, People criticized that the tab was responsible for the code of conduct, but the tab has always been responsible for the code of conflict for the past three years. So it wasn't something that people didn't, wasn't realizing. Um, they just didn't realize we were doing this. Um, also, a number of people confused the introductory process of the code of conflict with um, when we did the GPL statement. The GPL statement we shopped around for two years. The original code of conflict we did in three weeks. So one week versus three weeks. Yes, it was faster. But remember, we did this before. And that was issues at that time as well. So don't get this confused with the GPL statement, because I know a number of people have. Um, so we have a code of conflict, um, email alias. We're setting up a, a board of people. And we have Mishi, uh, certified mediator, to talk about things. Uh, <laughs> um, if you want to introduce yourself and say what you've done in open source and your background. As you can tell, I'm a lawyer. I really need my notes for everything. But um, um, let me start by congratulating you all. This is um, no small feat what you have achieved. Uh, I know that once uh, you are at that stage, it seems insignificant. And um, what I'm talking about is I don't think in the world there is any formal antagonist left who does not celebrate your way of making software and what you've taught the world about collaboration and sharing. So um, uh, thank you uh, for what you all have done. And I think uh, once you achieve that kind of global success, obviously your community has going, is going to grow in, a, in various ways, and you're going to welcome many different people. And that's why this discussion is important. And uh, whatever little role I can play to assist, I'm here. Uh, my name is Vishy Chaudhary. Uh, nobody ever confuses uh, about my origin. I am originally from India. I am based out of New York. I have been um, uh, serving the open source community now for almost 12 years. Um, I have been um, a lawyer for various uh, foundations, projects you've known, Free Software Foundation in the past, Apache Software Foundation, OpenSSL. Um, hopefully most of the foremost free software projects. I'm the legal director of Software Freedom Law Center. I have um, dealt with these issues. And um, what I want to say mostly is, um, I think Greg set out uh, uh, something uh, very interesting to be excellent and kind to each other. And I want to say that um, fairness and due process are not in conflict with kindness. And if uh, we can all just uh, start with trust and uh, to understand that we are here to um, listen carefully, not to make assumptions or judgments, but look into facts and find facts and uh, just be kind to each other. And if that's the guiding principle, everything else follows much more easily. Uh, I am here to help, uh, assist, and um, Understand, and I, one thing I've understood is that um, your community works because how great all of you are and how much that trust matters not only to the production of what you make for the world but for being with each other. And I will just help make that process better. Thank um, okay, thanks. Oh, I, there was one other thing about the process. Um, 
a lot of people have tried um, talking about changing the code of conduct that we have. Um, if there are, we took out one sentence that didn't work very well with our community, um, I would encourage everybody to work upstream because this code of conduct is used by many hundreds of other communities, Kubernetes, lots of other big ones. So any changes that we might need, they would also need as well. Originally, we did look at using this document when we wrote the code of conflict. It wasn't mature enough. It is mature enough now, but it can continue to get better. Um, there's been complaints about the people who wrote that document. Um, I will publicly say me and Richard Stallman do not get along, um, but I agree with his document. So you can ag disagree with the person, but you can agree with their work that they contributed. So RMS and I have had great flame floors. Um, so take it as what it is. It's a good document that works well for lots of communities. It's been worked on for many, many years. It can continue to be worked on. I think Josh is he, here has contributed patches upstream for that. So that's good. So continue to do that. Over time, if the upstream changes to take uh, new things that we think are valuable, we will take that as well. But like Lena said, let's let this sit for a while. Let's see how this works. And let's go forward from there. We don't want to talk about hypotheticals. We want to talk about real situations. And that's important. So do we open up for questions and discussion? Yes, Frank. Okay, so, but I'll, I'll push back on that. I don't agree with Richard Stallman's intent for what he does sometimes. And us as a kernel community have publicly, no, but I'm saying, us as a kernel community have publicly said that, too. Right. But we liked his document. And that's exactly what we're using this for. But this document that we've accepted was specifically written with a political intent, which is antithetical to many of us. And so acknowledge that that fact, and either agree with it or disagree with it, but at least acknowledge that some of us see a political intent that we don't like in that document itself, not the person, the document. Okay, so you're saying you don't agree with the political intent behind the document. Some people don't agree with the political intent behind the document. Right. Some, some, at least some portion of how that political intent is in the document. The whole anti-meritocracy is, is breaking point. Okay. So then, do you, if you agree with... What, what, so... So then, Adopt the meritocracy argument and accept the work for independent of the person. It's not the person. No, or uh, of the intent. Anyway, right. oh, we can agree to disagree about that part. Okay, so. Right, so. Okay, so I'll talk about the interpretation document for a second. Um, treat the code of conduct as the law and then treat the interpretation document of the interpretation of the law and how we need to apply that. That's very common in many governments or many um, countries, and I'll talk, um, shout out to Thomas Gleixner came up with this and pushed the idea and worked really hard on this. He also shopped it around a lot. Olaf did and Chris did, and Thomas did a lot of work on this stuff. So look at the interpretation. So if you feel that the interpretation um, needs to be changed in order to address issues, let's talk about that and we can, we can go from there. Um, but for now, let's let it sit for a while, maybe a few months, cool down, let's see how it goes. I understand your objection. I acknowledge your objection, but... So let's let this sit for a while, okay? I, I, I'll say that. Let's let this sit for a while. Uh, hold on, Rick. I think we need to rethink meritocracy a little bit. In big community projects, meritocracy is not just about the scope of the journey, but also about how well we manage to work with other people in that community yeah. and yeah. whether we manage to grow that community and keep it strong.
realize meritocracy was invented as a um, critique of the idea. It was a it was a fake word. It was it's not a good word, as far as how things right, go. It, 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 it was a, it was an objection to it was an objection to things. Right. So. Right, but there's also a social. Yes. Right, and so I don't think our document, and hopefully our document interpretation lays that out well. If not, then I'd be glad to revisit it in a few months. <laughs> we do need to give it a shot, but I want to let Mel go. He's yeah. had his hand up for a while. I think that's a great summary. I, I agree with uh, the vast majority of that. Only, I didn't say all because I can't remember every single thing. So, <laughs> um, I, I do want to apologize for not giving you a mic. Uh, so, if anybody. Is that the square? Yeah, the, the square thing we sacrificed so that three of us could have mics. So. Um, but so, if anyone didn't hear that, there were a lot of really good points in there about how we, we do deviate from upstream when we consider it crucial. And we are completely willing to. Um, one thing that uh, we do want to underline is that it's not crucial yet. Like we have no experiences that would make us need to deviate beyond where we already have. Because we did take out one sentence already. Um, so I, all right, hold on. I'm going to let Mel answer. <laughs> you, you brought, uh, Greg made a mention earlier and where you're drawing comparisons between law, but it'd be kind of cautious on using legal terms because none of us are qualified. However, at the risk of making a mess, law also has the ideas of case studies, or not case studies, case law. And at the, at the moment, we have an implementation of a spec that may or may not work out. There are going to be examples of getting this right, in, uh, right or wrong in the future, and it'll be kind of a case that some part of the interpret doc interpretation documentation is going to evolve based on a real live scenario where Either it was uh, someone who was junior that ended up feeling uh, excluded or that the feedback that they got was rampant, or there's a major cultural hiccup. And in terms of the cultural hiccup, cultural hiccups can come from anywhere. I am Irish. And historically, uh, the way that we interact with each other and treat each other is incompatible with pretty much every other country out of there. It would cause <laughs> a high degree of offense. Which basically means from, the, from absolute day one, I had to mediate how I would respond to people because they wouldn't get it and, or else there would just be massive offense caused. 
So it's not a case that there is some co uh, that there, uh, no matter where people are from, there is going to be a cultural hiccup, and eventually we're going to end up like with cases that have to be resolved. And based on the outcome of that, do a post mortem, see how the interpretation document needs to be achieved, and move on. Um, in Ireland, we actually have a specific cautionary against making laws too strict, and it comes down to if we make a law that our president decides to check the constitutionality of. They can send that to a court and have an abstract interpretation of it, and that, but that ruling is then final. It can never change after it. It has only been enacted once in the history of the state, because the grounds is if we make a judgment based without example, we end up tied into a corner and we're screwed. While the severity here is much less, it still is a case that we should wait until there are specific cases that we need to respond with. It does mean whoever is involved in that case is going to have a bad day, and I feel sorry for that future person. Um, I wish them the best, and I hope I'm not involved. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I think, um, you know, meritocracy, I'm, I'm going to change that word a little bit. I'm going to say, I don't think that uh, the intent, um, if we are giving the impression that somehow we are going to um, water down the quality of the code we accept, I don't think that is the case. Instead of saying meritocracy, what we would say is we still want high quality code coming in. We might reject the code um, using polite language and form language. So that's, that's how I am viewing um, the code of conduct. I think it has always been the case. We have done that. Um, so we are kind of formalizing what we did and you know, excluding some exceptions. So now there are no exceptions. Right. That's the best thing. That, so that's the key. There are no exceptions now. So, Frank, I'm not ignoring you, but I do want to let other people talk. I, I'm sorry. Mara. Yeah. Mara. Do you want to give them one? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Already forgot. Uh, uh, from my side, I, I guess uh, the change that we've done uh, by removing that paragraph and having someone with law uh, understanding were really, really important. I'm not quite sure how the interpretation document would work on a legislation like the one we have in Brazil, we use a different kind of legal system. I'm not sure if we have uh, as many uh, strange as it would be in the US, but it is good to have uh, at least one document that's uh, making things clear. But I'm still a little bit worried, and we had one uh, person uh, from Europe asking us to remove, it, it's actually not relate, directly related to the code of conduct, but they asked us uh, for the right of be forgiven, and we had to change uh, one, uh, we have to remove one email from one of our archives uh, because of the right to for be forgiven law in uh, Europe. And uh, my main concern is that someone may ask us to do the same at the canal Gitri. So I will speak to this, uh, lots of Linux Foundation, Oh, about the ba basic issue is the right to be forgiven uh, European data collection laws. Forgotten, forgotten forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's okay to be forgiven. Um, so Linux Foundation lawyers looked into this a lot when that law went into effect, and it is, um, they came to the conclusion that everything that is contributed to the kernel is public, and it does not have that, does not fall under that issue. You cannot go back and rewrite history in the kernel, kernel logs, you cannot go delete public email archives that people voluntarily send things publicly, so it does not count. So we do not have to worry about that issue um, as far as the legal interpretation goes. We had, that, that came up code of conduct or not many, about a year ago. So yeah. it's all, it's not, we do not, so if you have questions or people talking about that, talk to the technical advisory board, we'd be glad to do that and put those people in contact with the lawyers. That's our job here to do that. And we've done that for other legal issues that have come up. Talk to us, we'll put in share the right people. Those lawyers will talk to their lawyers, everybody will be happy. Yeah, you very rarely see lawyers give legal advice on mailing lists. Uh, <laughs> I, I think uh, you see a lot of people give legal advice on mailing lists, but it, somehow it always starts with, I am not a lawyer. <laughs> it's really weird. Um, 
But we certainly do uh, sympathize with people who have legal concerns and uncertainty, and we want to help you connect uh, with people who can actually answer those questions. I'm sure your companies can do a lot of this for you if you just ask. Uh, but if they refuse, then uh, we can try and help. Frank. Sorry, it'll be short. <laughs> So kind of the thing behind all of this is the idea of creating a better community, more inclusiveness, and you define your own inclusive, um, making us work better as a community. And I know the precipitating event was very different than that, but we as a community really do want to, f to grow the community. We want to work well together. And it seems like we ought to be doing, thinking about how to do that independently of code of conduct. So we can defer this discussion to later in the event if you want, to, if people want to talk about code of conduct specifically. So, but yeah. one thing specifically that I've thought of is you know, an action item. Uh, I'm on a couple of conference committees, and we could solicit speakers to talk about how do you review in a way that's say non-confrontational and way, way that's friendly to people. And this goes back in the 1980s and 90s in the commercial environment. We had classes on how to do code reviews in a way that wasn't really slamming people. It really was a cooperative technical thing. So I, I think there are a lot of specific things we could do, and that's just one tiny example. Um, how, how can we promote that, that sort of effort? Should the tab take on a thing of talking to conference committees? Uh, let's start a, uh, a task force because we're a commercial company. We, we always send things off to a task force or to a, a political committee or something, but is there something solid that we can do to start solving the underlying actual problem? So yeah, so sadly, a lot, independent of what just happened, a lot of people have been working on that issue on its own. Uh, the Linux Foundation is going to be announcing some initiatives they've been working on for many years. Um, I'd say go talk, Dan Williams has a talk tomorrow or today? When's Dan's talk? On the maintainer document on how, this afternoon, he's, taken on the burden of tackling a lot of those issues with this. And um, because for years we've talked about how do maintainers interact with developers, how to develop, what do developers expect from maintainers, what do maintainers expect from developers, how do we work together. He's taken the, the Herculean task of trying to set up, put out an initial document and we're going to iterate from there. Yes, so I agree. So uh, great one is um, Outreachy, Google Summer of Code. Um, there's some other stuff that's coming, um, programs like that. Um, sign up to be a mentor if you're not. Uh, sign up to volunteer for just reviewing patches. Um, right, so that, that's what, so talk to Dan, so he's doing that. So he's working on proposing that it's been in the, under the works for like a year now. So I think the point about supporting newbies is fantastic and we should absolutely continue to do this. But it's also important to remember that we as maintainers and experienced developers need to make sure we are treating with each other as respect as well. And make sure is that just because we, sh we should know better doesn't mean we can't always, uh, we won't always make mistakes. And making sure is, is that it's ultimately as maintainers, we are setting the example we want be get newcomers to the community to follow later as well. So that's something to keep in mind when thinking about these things as well. But yes, absolutely supporting new people and supporting ourselves and existing maintainers. And I'd love to see that the maintainers documents include supporting other maintainers as well, so. Yeah, and so I, I mean, I got to play Linus for a month. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, we as maintainers, everybody does something differently. Everybody sent a different pull request. Everybody, I had to, it was not fun. I asked Linus how he did it. He said he has a bunch of macros. He said it's not fun. We can make it nicer to Linus. It'll be nicer to us. Um, don't do, and people push the boundaries with me. Don't push boundaries, you know, sometimes like that. Um, so even maintainers can be nicer to the other maintainers they interact with. And I think we need to codify a little bit of that and make things easier. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, tangential to this and a little bit what Frank said. We have been optimizing for a long time to um, make sure that the people who stick around are the people we care about code from. Usually 
when you come with a patch, we, we care about the quality of the patch, but traditionally we also care a lot about whether you're gonna be around if there's a problem with this code, you know, six months from now or something like that. And I think there's a lot of groups that are working on improving tools, improving various things. We have the zero day builder, we have kernel CI, we have a lot of things going on where it's gonna be easier and easier to make sure that the code is decent when it goes in and maybe relieve a little bit of the pressure of making sure that you're hanging around and, and um, looking after the code. And I think that's something that can greatly broaden the contributor base, but it's not easy to do, and I think we're chipping away at it, um, and it's heading in the right direction. Um, like other things, I think there's aspects of this we need to be wary of, and in this case, it's the emphasis on individual responsibility rather than the delegation upwards to uh, perceived authority, be it the technical advisory board, maintainers, or otherwise. Maintainer load is high. The, but as, as aside from that, uh, so as, aside from it, uh, adding to their load, that will cause issues in and itself if they are deemed to be responsible. But at the end of the day, we have individual responsibility as well. And the fact of the matter is that there's always going to be elements of the community that are temperamentally unsuited to mentor or encourage new people to contribute. This is neither right or wrong, sometimes it simply is, and it's best to acknowledge that some people are temperamentally unsuited to act in a mentorship role. In the event that you see cases where someone is getting crucified in a review, um, e even, if it's, uh, even if it's friendly and p to focusing completely on the technical merits of it, uh, you have an individual responsibility to intervene. And I'll give an example. You can, you can, in a very friendly fashion, tear a patch apart without explaining even once what you would accept as being correct, as in an alternative implementation or some other way of doing it. So you can be very friendly, but the passive aggressive nature of it doesn't necessarily help the person. Mm -hmm. Complaining to maintainers or the technical advisory boards doesn't help. In the event that you see something like that and you feel that you are temperamentally suited to help a person, intervene, add on to the review, suggest to the person what they might do differently or how it would work. Otherwise, engage the person who, who did the initial review and try and get them to say, what is it that you would accept? Which parts of this are actually wrong? Is it like a workload that you would evaluate? Is it a styling issue? Um, is there some other part that you feel that you need to be cleaned up first? If you have more experience than the person getting hammered, intervene and through your review process, extract from the temperamentally unsuited person what it is that, 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 that the new person needs to succeed. I, 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 I don't think it's fair to say the maintainers would fix it or the technical advisory board fix it. If you have opinions on how it should be fixed, review, help, don't complain. Yeah, and reach out. If I'm acting snarky, call me on privately, <laughs> but, <laughs> or you can do it publicly, but I'm saying reach out and, and inter intervene if you have the time and notice it, because that's the best way to diffuse issues. Yeah, that's basically what I was going to say. I mean, Sometimes we don't necessarily have the capacity, the time right. to mentor. If there is a patch and it is suboptimal, sometimes I don't know the answer. Sometimes I won't know the answer until I go and try to implement it myself three times and work out which one I hate least. And sometimes it's hard to give the constructive feedback. Sometimes it's easy and sometimes people fail to do so when they should and that's absolutely right. But also sometimes you can't actually say how you want to see it done. You can only say, and I don't like this, I, yeah. I think that's a corner case that doesn't always happen, but the solution to that isn't necessarily to avoid the maintainer's response for dedicated up to their task. E no. Even if it's a case that you, you feel like that, they kind of... Even, even if it's a case you encounter a situation where you feel like that, and you end up having to say, I'm not comfortable with this, but I'm not sure how to explain how it could be done differently until I can try, at least just include that, because then at least the person knows where to stand. 
One thing that I've seen where people ended up falling down was because people aren't comfortable with what they're doing. They didn't clarify that and they let the person involved work for another six to nine months on it, in which case they said no and had a more coherent response. And in my mind, that's throwing someone down a hole. So now they've started kind of intervening when they see something like that happen. It's unfortunate. But again, the central point was there's a degree of individual responsibility. If you see behavior like this and you think that it should be done differently and you're a, you're a member of the community, get involved. Don't bother saying that the maintainer should do something or the technical advisory board to do something because that doesn't scale. If you have strong opinions on how things should be done correctly, do it through example. If you see someone who is temperamentally unsuitable tearing somebody apart, don't necessarily challenge that person. Instead, rewrite the review in a way that is consumable by somebody. That's definitely good advice. And I think the one thing that this doc and this change has made clear is that everybody is okay to um, behave, bad behavior is unexpected or accepted by anybody. Um, another thing to reply and, and comment a little bit on what David was saying. If you're in a position where you're the only one who can review the code for your subsystem, see this as a growing opportunity for somebody else and try to fi find somebody else that can deal with this. I mean, it's how we all end up spinning up new maintainers to help you out and, and stuff like that. There are places of the kernel where <coughs> nobody else wants to touch it and you might be on the hook. Um, of course, it's always hard, uh, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I mean, this is also how we grow new maintainers and, and you know, see it as, as an opportunity for that. But I, I do want to put in a plug for Dan Williams' uh, maintainer's guide talk. You know, a lot of these, uh, it's really interesting how intertwined code of conduct issues and maintainer issues are. Um, and uh, one of the really great things about writing down the uh, maintainer's guide is I'm hoping it will give us a chance to look at it and say, this is ridiculous. I can't believe we've been working this way for this long. How in the world does this function at all? <laughs> and um, then once we have those moments where we read it and say it out loud and say, wow, that's just crazy, um, you know, those are the places that we can examine and say, this is how we make being a maintainer much easier. Uh, and hopefully by doing that, we make it much easier to be a contributor as well. Uh, so that's a plug for Dan's talk. Yeah, just as a general comment, um, one thing a mentor taught me when I was first starting to take on leadership roles in the IETF, which like the Linux kernel development community is a volunteer organization, is ultimately as a leader in a volunteer organization, your only power is to say no, right? You can't compel other people to do things. Uh, and the corollary to that is, if you are looking for something to happen, asking a leader to make X, Y, Z happen generally won't work, right? If you want it to happen, you should do it yourself, right? Or try to find other people to work with you to make something happen. Um, and we may know this um, in the language, sounds great, send a patch, right? So when people say, yes, you know, what is the tab doing to, you know, reach out more to newbies beyond outreach. It's like, if you've got a great idea, you know, try and do it. Now, if you need help getting resources, um, the TAB and other leaders may be able to help you get resources, right? But that's different from asking people to actually do something that you really want to see happen, right? <clears throat> and it's not always just the resources. In some cases, you might know what you want to do. You don't know how to do it. That's another type of resource, right? But um, you don't have to have all the answers when you come up with an idea either. And, and so I want to take um, Ted's comment back to the code of conduct for just a second. Um, in general, I think there are actually four different answers that people have to patches. Uh, the first one is yes. Uh, the second one is no. The third one is no with a big list of reasons of how you want it to look different. And uh, the fourth one is no, with the list of reasons of how you want it different, and a long story about how the patch is terrible and the author should reconsider their life choices. <laughs> and so that's the one I want to get rid of. Th that's the one that doesn't really add anything to the community. And from a code of conduct point of view, if we can accomplish that, uh, we're much better off than we were. 
So uh, I missed whose hand went up first. I'm going to uh, go first. So following up, I think, on Ted's and kind of your, your point, the other thing to keep in mind is that with, with the code of conduct, I've seen uh, quite a few talks about code of conduct and enforcement. And really, the thing is, is that most code of conduct issues are going to be things that we can ultimately handle among ourselves. And it's not going to require escalation. And it's going to be using our own good judgment that we already have as the kernel community to be able to solve these types of problems. And the purpose of the code of conduct is to establish what we as a kernel community value and then for the more serious issues, which which may arise someday, hopefully not, but you have to plan for those things. And so the purpose of the Code of Conduct is to plan for both the every day-to-day -day stuff and the worst possible outcomes, which, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I hope you never need me. And <laughs> <laughs> mostly my endeavor is actually not to bill you or do anything, but to be redundant. But uh, I want to support one thing is that uh, having watched so many different projects, each project, of course, works differently based on what their licenses are. Or, But each community has its own features. And, uh, um, and and I think that each of you, each community figures out how they want to resolve these issues and what is the example they want to set, what are the things they want to do. And mostly it's not, uh, um, the, these kind of code of conduct are not set in stone because these are, these may be your constitution, but you have the ability to amend or change it. It's not that we are taking it out to a court and trying to tell them, okay, there is an interpretation. That's why the community itself decides what they want, how they want, what the terms are, and also the resolution. The more you can resolve it, the better it works out for each of you. And I'm there, but uh, as I said, hopefully I'm never required. And I, I think that's an important point where the con community contact point isn't necessarily just the police contact when somebody's committed a crime. If you're a maintainer, if you see something going on and you need to ask somebody, hey, how would I deal with this? Um, can you help me out? I don't want this to happen. What can I do? Uh, reach out. Be clear that it's not necessarily a violation report and you don't want it investigated, but reach out for help. I mean, it's a resource that's there for everybody. Yes, yeah, yes, yes was first. Uh, Sorry. So no. I was, I've been sitting here listening and I agree with a lot of, well, pretty much all of it. Um, there's one corner case that keeps hitting my mind, which I think we're kind of ignoring in all this because we keep talking about uh, this might be a little bit of a tangent. Um, we keep talking about how we need to be helpful and friendly and try and encourage people to do the right thing. But we have historically seen this um, problematic contributors who don't want to listen and the downright trolls. I mean, we all remember sort of Mr. Krause. Um, how do we cope with that? Because some of these people are deliberately trying to basically piss people off and provoke. And, and I just don't see a there's a lot of talk about how to cope with that in a constructive way because there are times where you just either can't answer or simply have to tell the person to bugger off and don't come back. So that is in, that's independent of the code of conduct right. and we've handled that independently for years on our own. Sure. I mean, the issue, case you brought up, um, we got them banned and then banned again and then banned again and banned again um, as they kept changing email addresses and he's back, he's banned again. Um, <laughs> literally, that's a couple weeks ago. Um, so it's just, that's independent. So it's a corner case, it's annoying. Talk to us, we'll take care of it. It's, it's pretty cut and dry. It's but obvious no, the rules. The reason I'm bringing it up is just to be keep talking about how we should always be positive in our, no, no, no. In yeah, our so help. And I totally agree with that, right? It's just that we, we have to ac accept that there are those cases where we have to sort of use we the all unpleasant agree. tool. And if anybody wants a copy of my kill file, I'm welcome to give it to you. <laughs> um, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be the case. So, so uh, before we uh, go anymore, we only have, I think, four minutes left. So um, I do want to encourage, yep. Yep. So um, I, have, I have dealt with a fair number of trolls in my days. Um, one of the most effective ways of dealing with trolls is to not let them provoke you and instead don't also don't let them pull you into a debate because that's what they want they want to waste your time and what you know in in case of one particular one particular troll started responding to each one of his emails with dear wrongbot no I think the only thing here is the troll example was kind of the extreme, but there's also these, 
we have also seen problems with contributors who have worked on something. I mean, the classic is somebody in a corporate environment works on something for a couple of years, doing their things their way, and then they come to the mailing list and they're being told, we're not going to take this. You're on the wrong path. You should have talked to us six, two years ago. And they just keep pushing it. And I know that is something that has pissed Linus off in the past. Yeah, and it's pissed us all off in the past. Yeah. And it'll happen again. But that's just learning to work with our community. We're saying in the interpretation document, we are not changing how we work or address that. We just will tell them nicely. <laughs> um, or we will just, it's OK to just not respond sometimes. After responding nicely, yes. Yes. If, yes, there is the law of diminishing returns, and I agree with that. So I think about Mel and Stuart. Yeah. Mel has waited long. I'll be really quick. Um, it, it, I, I saw a pattern that people were focusing too much on enforcement or not enforcement. Um, it's too black and white. I know we're all binary and thinking, but it's too black and white. Never forget that de-escalation is a, an option if you see something going wrong. If you get uh, the life choices review that Chris used, anyone doesn't need a maintainer as can can step in and rewrite that review in a not life choices fashion, and that means that you will end up taking some of the blowback from the person who's temperamentally unsuited, but at least the aggression will be spread then, uh, probably by somebody who already knows what shape the aggression is going to be. It's not nice, but de-escalation is a preferable path to enforcement or not enforcement. Yes, and now. Sure. So, that's what I'll so yeah, definitely. So one thing I have used is uh, in the past um, is just sit on an email. If you get an email that's negative, just sit on it for a bit. Don't have to respond right away. So if you respond right away, you end up you end up escalating, not de-escalating. So, um, and sometimes um, I have used this a lot. Um, many of you, I came to support and say. Hey, what should I? How should I respond? Am I doing? Should I? Should I have phrased my email differently? So, lean on support. So I, you know, I'm, I'm, I can help if anybody wants, you know, get stressed out and say, hey, should I have done something differently? Just send me email privately. I, have, I use that technique a lot too. So. And I think we're out of time. Right, Chris? Yeah. Sorry, Frank. We, we have this room. Um, there's nothing in this room, but there are people who, there are maybe people who want to go to, say, Arn's end of talk 19 years to go in Pavilion AB or the embedded thermal use cases. So if people need to run, um, I'm sure we can stick around, but uh, I, I don't want to run over and uh, disturb other tracks. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>